Hello, everybody. So lots of good things happened this weekend, hey? Just yesterday was so much fun, riding bikes and walking and everything. And way to go, TNC, with your generosity, just echoing what, what Craig just said. But that was awesome. Today, we're talking about Moses and the burning bush. And I just would like to pray first before I speak. Father, we just thank you that you are here with us. That you do reveal yourself. That your presence is all around us, even when we can't feel you. But we thank you for the times when we can palpably feel you among us, beside us, and in us. Lord, this morning I think you have lots to say to us. And thank you for your scripture, your word, that we can hear stories about you and how you have moved in, in people's lives over hundreds and thousands of years, Lord. May we be a people that move with you on mission as well. So speak, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews 11. Sorry, this glasses thing is not happy. I'm not happy about it. <laughs> Hebrews 11, great examples of faith is the title of that chapter. It says, what is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It is the evidence of things we cannot yet see. And then when you move over, and so it goes through all these great spiritual giants that that we read about all through scripture. And then it gets to verse 23 and it hits on Moses. And it says it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months. They saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid of what the king might do. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be treated as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of the Messiah than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the great reward that God would give him. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt. He was not afraid of the king. Moses kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorposts so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground, but when the Egyptians followed, they were all drowned. When we read that, man, Moses, what a great man of faith he was. And we read that, and it just kept saying, by faith, by faith, by faith. But also, he was not afraid. He kept right on going, and, and he, he was used by God. And so you read that, and you think, wow, if only I could be like him. And then we go back and actually into Exodus the book of Exodus and actually read about Moses? Well, he was a mess. Like, this person that we read about in the New Testament, he didn't start out that way. It is the most beautiful story of a person who was transformed and shaped by God. But it took him a lot of work and a lot of faith to get there. And his first response to the Lord was not, yes, let's do this. It was, he had, he had a lot. We'll get into that. But this, I, I, I wanted originally to call this message by faith. And now I've kind of changed my mind. It's about turning our fear into faith. Because we live in a world full of fear right now. And humanity, we, we suffer from fear depression and anxiety and all of these things, especially right now, it's its own pandemic. But God's desire for his people is not that we be a fearful people. It, he doesn't want us to be despairing. His desire is that we would be filled with his, his peace and his joy and that we would participate with him. So this story of Moses and the burning bush is a story that calls God's people back to who they followed. 
and it calls his people back to whom they had a covenant with. It is a story we need to hear today to remind ourselves of who we follow today and who we have a covenant with today. It's a story about turning fear into faith, which leads to joy and peace. It's a story of a God who loves, who calls and invites, and who transforms his people. God could save the world all by himself. But he chooses us. He calls us to participate with him. Because he wants us to flourish. Because he loves us. Because he wants us to know him. And he wants to know us. And so it is a beautiful story of a man who wrestled through a lot of stuff. And eventually became that man they talk about in Hebrews. So let's just give a little bit of the backdrop to Moses, okay? So his, the woman, his mom who gave birth to him, was living in slavery in Egypt at a time when Pharaoh gave an order to kill all the, Israelite, all the newborn Israelite boys into the Nile River and spare the baby girls. So this woman is pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Can you imagine the fear? Can you imagine what that would be like to live during those times? But she saw what a beautiful and unusual baby he was, so she kept him hidden for three months. And finally it got to a stage where she couldn't hide him any longer. So she made this basket out of papyrus reeds and, with, and kept it to get waterproofed it with tar. And, and she placed it in the reeds along the edge of the Nile River. I'm not sure where she was going with this. But she put it there, and it floated away. And unbeknownst to her, her daughter Miriam was watching. So Moses' older sister was watching this whole thing. And Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the Nile with her servant girls, and she saw this thing in the Nile River. And so she sent her servant girl to go get it. She brings the basket back to the, to the princess. They open it up, and there's a baby boy crying. And it struck her heart. Like she took compassion on this baby and she picked it up and she was holding it. And Miriam, Moses' sister, approaches the princess and says, Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse this baby for you? And the princess says, Yes, please do. And so the girl rushes home and gets Moses' mom, brilliant, and, take, and takes the child home to her and, and, or, and nurses him. And the princess offered to pay the mom to nurse her own baby. It was beautiful. But later, when, she w when he was older, he was still not out of danger. And so his mom brought him back to the princess. And the princess adopted Moses into her family as her son. And so he lived in the lap of luxury. He grew up in the palace. He had all the, the privileges of a prince, the prince of Egypt. And many years later, when he was all grown up, Moses went out to visit his people, the Israelites, and he saw how hard they were being forced to, to work. And during that visit, he saw an Egyptian, an Egyptian beating up one of the Hebrew slaves, and he was enraged, and he went and he made sure no one was looking, so he thought, and he killed that Egyptian man. And then the next day, two of the Hebrew people were fighting, and he went to speak to them and sort it out. And they said, oh, are you going to kill us just like you killed that Egyptian? And so Moses realized he had been seen, and Pharaoh had seen him kill this Egyptian man. And so he was terrified, and he fled for his life, and he went to a place called Midian. It's in the middle of nowhere, and he sat down by a well, and there happened to be this priest there who had seven daughters, and they came regularly to this well to get water to feed their flock. But they were always getting badgered by all the other shepherds and everything, and so it was always a, a, a difficult time for them. And Moses saw what was going on, and so he came to their rescue, and he also fed their flocks and so the girls went back to their dad and they told him what happened he goes well we'll get this guy bring him back for dinner we have to honor him and so he brought they brought Moses back and long story short he ended up marrying one of the daughters and he became a shepherd this is 40 
or so he for 40 years he worked as a shepherd in the middle of nowhere as a nobody so 40 years later he's out watching the flock of his father-in-law near the mountain of god which later became mount sinai and suddenly the angel of the lord appeared to him as a blazing fire in the bush now it wasn't uncommon for bushes just to catch fire in that climate and that terrain but Moses was amazed because the bush was engulfed in flames but it didn't burn up and he was like amazing he said to himself why isn't that bush burning up I have to go over and see this and so when the Lord saw that he had caught Moses's attention God called to him from the bush Moses Moses okay couple things here First of all, it started out by saying the angel of the Lord appeared in the fire. And then it turned to say God called him. And a couple weeks ago when I was speaking, I was saying that every story in the Bible points us to Jesus. Everything is pushing us that way. And so it was really important when we're reading all these stories, like look for signs where it's pointing to Jesus. And it could be actual prophecy or it could be symbolism, different things. But in this case, God was in the bush and the scholars are thinking that was Jesus before his incarnation Jesus was there calling Moses Moses and the second thing is he called his name twice with an urgency and that has happened throughout the Bible when God has something to say it was Abraham Abraham Samuel Samuel Paul Paul like get their attention and Paul's response just like Abraham's we talked about a couple weeks ago Paul's response was here I am there was no doubt or question in his mind who was speaking to him and he said here I am and God said don't come any closer take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground And then he said, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he hid his face in his hands because he was afraid to look at God. So here is Moses. The presence of God is in this burning bush, and it is this holy place because God is there. And, and, and God is reminding him who he is. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is who I am. And what was Moses' reaction? He hid his face in his hands because he was so aware of his own sinfulness. In Isaiah 6, 1 to 8, there's a story when God called Isaiah and wanted to send him out. It was the same thing. When you have a true encounter with the God of the entire universe, you become very aware of your own unworthiness, your own sinful nature, all the things. And I'm sure Moses was standing there going, I am the guy that murdered a man. I am the guy that just messed up in so many ways throughout my life. I'm just trying to live a quiet life in obscurity. And now I am in the presence of, of the God of all creation. And he was afraid to look at him. But the Lord told him, you can be sure I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries for deliverance from their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come to rescue them from the Egyptians and to lead them out of Egypt into their own good and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and all the ites live there. (laughs) The cries of the people have reached me, like God's compassion for his people. And I have seen how the Egyptians have oppressed them with heavy tasks. And here's the commissioning. So Moses is hiding his face, and God's telling him, I've seen you and your people. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You will lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. What a moment. 
Are there moments in your life where you, I would call them a burning bush moment, where you have felt the presence of God so palpably in your life? Or have you had an experience where you felt the call of God on you, asking you to do something or say something or become something? Have you had a moment? I want you just to take a, a second with the person next to you. I'm going to give you two minutes just to describe if there was a moment where you knew you were standing in the presence of God. One more minute. Ten more seconds. Okay. I know I put you on the spot, but I'm glad to hear that people were talking, unless you were just making lunch plans. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm hoping it was a God story. I've labeled some of mine. I have a shout to the Lord moment. You know that song from Hillsong? It was 1995. I was at Green Bay Bible Camp in West Kelowna. I was crossing the dining room hall to the microwave with my baby in my hand and a baby bottle. I was going to nuke in the... That was bad that I was going to nuke a baby bottle. But anyway, I was walking across, and I heard the kitchen staff, and they had their music blasting, and it was shout to the Lord. And I stopped in my tracks because I'd never heard this song. I grew up in it, or I was at a church that was very traditional, hymns only, hymn books, the whole thing. And I'd never heard a worship song like that. And in that moment, it was like I lived a whole lifetime in my, in my I can't even explain it, in my spirit. And God revealed himself in worship in a way I'd never experienced before. I honestly should have taken off my shoes because it was holy ground. I think I was in flip-flops, but still, it was holy ground. I knew the Lord had shown me true worship. The next time I was becoming the children's director at our church, being called into ministry, and it was Psalm 78 laid on my heart as ministering to the next generation so that they could tell their children and their children and their children's children. It was this Psalm 78 moment, and that was not the direction my life was going because I also had my minivan moment at the corner of Scott Road and, and 64th Avenue in Surrey where this voice in my head, not audible, but it was so loud in my head I turned around telling me to go back to school. You see, I had a great job at Children's Hospital working for the head of pediatric cardiology. I was set for life. I had good money, pension, the whole bet, and great people, great place to work, and God called me out of that. And then just this week, three days ago, on the holy island of Lindisfarne, I had the most amazing moment with the Lord is he spoke to me through another person sitting on a bench staring at the North Sea. These are moments we need to take note of and listen. And you know, I wish I was the person like they describe in Hebrews 11, but I'm more like Moses in all of these things. Moses' response to God when he said, you, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You will lead my people out, out of Egypt. He says, who am I? But who am I 
to appear before Pharaoh? How can you expect me to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? Man, I ask that question every week, every Monday morning. Who am I? What, why am I doing this? And Moses used to be the prince of Egypt. He had a big identity, and now he was a mere shepherd, and he'd lost sight of who he was from all his life experience. He lost sight of his identity in God, in Christ. And how did God respond to him? With compassion. He said, I will be with you. And this will serve as proof that I have sent you. When you have brought the Israelites out of Egypt, you will return here to this very mountain and you will worship me. He gives him this promise that it's going to turn out in the end. But then Moses protested again. He's like, I, I'm a nobody. I need credentials. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they won't believe me. They're going to ask, which God are you talking about? What is his name? Then what do I tell them? And God says, I am who I am. Just tell them, I am has sent you. Again, pointing to Jesus, I am living water. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. God said, tell them the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Again, the reminder of who this God is. Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. I am. This will be my name forever. It has always been my name, and it will be used throughout all generations. And I can sure, assure you today, in 2024, he is still I am. He is eternal, forever eternal. And then he says, you can be sure I am watching over you. Or, or he's saying to tell the Israelites, you can be sure I am watching over you. I have seen what is happening to you in Egypt. I promise to rescue you from the oppression of the Egyptians. I will lead you to the, the land now occupied by the Can Can Canaanites and the rest of them. A land flowing with milk and honey. The leaders of the people of Israel will accept your message. And then all of you must go straight to the king of Egypt and tell him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us go on a three-day journey. Three days again, remember, points to the New Testament. Let us go on a three-day journey into the wilderness and offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God. God maps out for him. Here's the plan. Here is what I want you to do. But God also knows this is not going to be easy for Moses, not just because he's insecure, but the Israelites, they've been in slavery for 400 years, and even though it's awful, it's the demon they know. Change is hard. They're going to give Moses some grief because What's this promised land? What are you talking about? What, what do you mean when you want to? They've set down roots, generations and generations, born into slavery. So it's going to be really difficult for them to believe that Moses is legit and that God is actually sending him. And Moses is very aware of this. And, and God even says, I know the king of Egypt will not let you go except under heavy pressure, so I will reach out and strike at the heart of Egypt with all kinds of miracles, and then at last he will let you go. And it, he's referring to those plagues and everything that are going to come later. And the, the hardest part about preparing this message was it's so much. I didn't know how to narrow it down. Exodus 3 and 4, there's so much in here. But So I'll go as fast as I can. But Moses pro protested again. He, we're in Exodus 4 now. He protested again. And, and he's asking God, or telling him actually, why this is not going to work. Why Moses is not a good choice for this task. And God continues to show Moses how he's going to protect him. He even says, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff. And he turns it into a snake. He's showing Moses his supernatural power. He's saying, I am with you. You will have my power with you. 
And he showed him a few different things to say, you don't need to worry. I'm here with you. But God was very patient with all the questions that Moses had for him. He just kept answering and answering. And then finally, Exodus 4, 14, or 13, Moses again pleaded. After all the signs of wonder and miracles he just saw before his eyes, he still says to God, Lord, please send someone else. Well, that just made God mad. Up until that point, you see, Moses, until this commissioning, when he first encountered God, encountered God, he's just experiencing God at a distance, like take off your sandals, it's holy ground. Then he becomes aware of his sinful nature and all the bad things he had done. And God is inviting him into his presence saying, come with me. I will be with you, and he's patient and compassionate and answering all his questions, telling him how this is going to work, all the self-doubt, all the things. And then finally, after all of that, Moses just says, send someone else. It was when he became unwilling to cooperate that God got angry with Moses. That was it. All the self-doubt and that, God's like, no, I got this. I'm going to help you but you just got to be willing. Can you just please say yes and obey? And even in that, even in his annoyance, God relented and he said, fine, I will give you Aaron as your spokesperson. And Aaron is Moses' brother and he was a good speaker. But let's be clear, Aaron was not the spokesperson for God. He was a spokesperson for Moses. Moses told, was, was representing God and told Aaron what to say. And he gave Aaron to Moses to help him speak, to help him lead, and just that extra boost of confidence. And that is the God that we worship. That is the God that we follow a God who desperately desires to participate with his people, who wants to see us transformed and confident and courageous. He knows we have fears, but fear needs to be turned into faith. That is the only way through, is to say, in spite of my fear, fear in the midst of my fear, I will say yes and I will step out. It requires, that kind of faith requires being all in. It reminds me of when I was learning to slalom wa water ski and we had to go across the wake. And if you hold back for a second behind the boat and have a second thought about it, you'll fall at the very least. You'll probably get injured, even worse. But you can't hold back. You, can't, you just have to hunker down and go across the wake all in don't look back and the crazy thing is you don't fall because you did it with confidence even in your fear and believe me I was fearful but that's what God is calling us into he's asking us to work with him and you see the thing is this he understands we're human He's heard all the responses before any of us. He knows who he's dealing with, and yet he still asks. He still desires. You see, we say we believe in God, but he believes in us with his power and him at front and center. He knows we can do whatever he asks of us. And often, God will not speak to the wider world until he gets the attention of his own people. So I ask you, what is God speaking to us today? The world is a mess. We're a mess. And yet he's asking us to act, to follow, to say yes for the sake of the world because he needs us to help him. What is he trying to get our attention on? By faith. That is the only way to get through or overcome a situation. Deep trust in God's promises. 
when we ask the questions, why me? Who am I to? There is no way I could. That requires faith and trust. And that is why it is so important to keep reading scripture so that we can see how God moved through the entire book, Genesis to Revelation, where we can see the story of God's callings and his fulfilled promises. And it's important to look back on your own life and those around you to see how God has already brought you through things. We should have a laundry list behind us of situations that we didn't think we could get through, and yet here we are. Do you think that was coincidence? God was with you. He's still with us, with you, and he will be with us forever. But it's by faith. By faith. And in spite of our fear, turn that fear into faith. Because on the other side of that fear is joy and peace that only comes from God. It doesn't promise a better situation. It promises you strength and hope and joy and peace. You should have a paper in your hand that Beth handed out. And it's called By Faith. As we come into communion, and we're going to take it together, as we come into communion, I want you to just take a moment to look at that and think about a situation in your past where you did step out in faith and God was there right with you. Or maybe there's something right now that he's nudging you, asking you, and you're resisting. You have doubt. And fill out that line. By faith, I, Deb Judas, walked with in the past or will walk with God through and write the situation down. Craig, is the band coming up?